<laughs> it's my absolute pleasure to welcome so many of you here today uh, to the kinship carers who have come from across the whole of the UK to come and speak about your experiences and also to speak directly to members of Parliament. For those of you who are lucky enough not to know who I am, and I'm afraid and knows who I am, my name is Martin Doherty Hughes and I'm delighted and honoured to be and Member of Parliament for West Dumbartonshire, and that's the great borough of Clyde Bank, the ancient borough of Dumbarton and the mighty Vale of Leven. And it's an absolute honour and privilege and to welcome you and all the team from across the UK to talk about the diversity of kinship carer uh, issues and also to highlight them to members of the UK Parliament. And I do know that there are other members here who have joined us, but before I ask them to introduce themselves, can I just have a couple of housekeeping issues? If you have a mobile phone, can I ask you to at least put it on silent, if not to turn it off? Um, if you're a member who's still here while your phone goes off and you need to answer it, can I ask you to do it outside? Otherwise, please don't answer it. Uh, if you hear a bell ring, it might mean that the members of the House of Commons have to run for a vote, but I don't think it'll happen. If a bell rings and we don't move, it's the House of Lords. There's none of them here, I believe, so we don't even worry about that. Can I, without further ado, ask the Members of Parliament to introduce themselves, and then I'll go straight for the panel as well. Maybe to my right, to my left, if you would take it. Mark Spencer, member of Parliament for Sherwood in Nottinghamshire. I'm John McNally, I'm the member for Falkirk in Central Scotland. I'm Gavin Williams, I'm the MP for Paisley in Renfrewshire North, and I have a, a care of working for me, who's quite a well known advocate for care of mm -hmm. rights in Scotland as well. And I'm Margaret Terry, I'm the member for Rutherglen in Hamilton West. Now, what I'm also going to do, and I'm delighted you're all here, and I know that other members of Parliament will be popping in and out. Parliament's one of those kind of strange places, well, this Parliament, as it seems, that you have to be in different places at the exact same time. Uh, so uh, I hope you appreciate that those members who can't be here uh, will also know about what you're doing and why you're here. Okay. But without further ado, can I maybe ask the panel, and we'll go through the speakers process. No, there's Anne, then Kim, Sadie. So Anne, if you could just maybe introduce yourself, and then we'll go to Kim, and then Sadie, and the rest. Okay. okay. And um, maybe help if you... Project. 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 I shout a wee bit. Right, uh, my name's Anne Schwartz. I'm a kinship carer and chair of the Scottish Kinship Care Alliance and I'm from Western mm -hmm. Kim? Uh, I'm Kim and I'm from the Single Mothers Self Defence Group, which is part of the Global Women's Strike and we're based here in London. Sadie? I'm Sadie from the Alliance Kinship Carer and chairperson of the North Glasgow. Lee? Hello, I'm Lee Palmer and uh, I'm a carer and I won a high court battle against the DWP. Yeah. Yes. 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 yes, I'm Crystal, I'm a carer and uh, I work with Black Women's Rape Action Project here in London. Micheline? Uh, I'm Micheline, I'm a kinship carer and I'm chair of Western Berkshire Kinship Care. That's fantastic. Well, welcome to all of you, and on behalf of Shia, speaking to all the members who are here from the House of Parliament, can we thank you for everything that you do, both for those you care for and the way in which you support the rest of the country, because quite frankly, if it wasn't for you, much of what you do could not be done. So thank you very much indeed. Without further ado, I'm going to ask the panel, if you maybe correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to go through the panel. Uh, you want to take questions while you're speaking, or do you want to wait till after? 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 Okay. Yeah. So can I ask you, if you do have questions, can I ask you to wait for after? Can I also say as a Scottish constituency MP, uh, I know there's a few of them in the room, uh, kinship care issues are actually devolved to the Scottish Parliament. So if you've got questions for us and we don't have the answers, we can always make sure we get them for you. Okay. So, Anne, without further ado, off you go. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the Alliance was set up uh, three years ago. And it's a network of groups from across Scotland, support, kinship support groups. Um, we came together to challenge further the Scottish Government. I mean, carers like Sadie and others in this room have been doing this for 10, 15 years, trying to change what was going on for the children and families. So we decided, why don't we join together, join our forces, and see if that would get a stronger voice at the Scottish Parliament. From there, we 
along with other organisations, have managed to, for the first time, we get kinship care into legislation in Scotland, which is a massive achievement. Latterly, they put in a new system which we challenged and fought for to get. They promised in 2007 they would put us on palliative and foster care for the allowances for the children. It took a further seven years to get that done. They've now got that, however, it's not working the way it should. So we've still got a lot of battles to fight until we get it where we want it to be. One of our main issues is that when the universal credit comes in, you know, when it fully rolls in, um, kinship carers, particularly pensioners, will not be entitled to claim child tax credit. Mm. And if they don't meet the right criteria within the new setup, you know, if they don't have large children, it's going to be a very, very big challenge because they'll be bringing these kids up on their pension, nothing else. They'll not be entitled to any of the state pen you know, benefits like child tax credit, child benefit, things like that. We've also got uh, another situation where we've got a section 50 payment out of the church. It's the way they pay the allowances under the Children's Scotland Act 1995. The section 50 payment is considered as a maintenance payment. And then there's the section 22, which is considered as the well-being payment, which is what the new system is going to be paid from. However, some authorities prior to now have been paying it out of the maintenance allowance and also saying it was okay for the carers to go and get tax credits on top of that, which means there was a double maintenance payment getting paid. And I've been getting uh, calls from carers saying that they're going to have to pay thousands of pounds back to tax credits <coughs> through no fault of their own. So that's why we're down here, because this is not an issue that the Scottish Government can change. We need the support down here to get that changed. Um, and we won't, we won't stop till, you know, all these children get support, because what, what's happened is the new system will support children who are considered as looked after children, the same as children in foster care. They then, ex, you know, they put that on a parity, but then they changed it and included children who were on what they call a residence order. And sometimes they just say it's informal, but it's not. So they're allowing some of those children to claim this allowance, new allowance. However, if they don't have a previous lack status to go into a residence order, they won't get it. There's 5,200 children, they say, are going to get this allowance. But there's 20, 25,000 plus children out there in Scotland who are not going to get that financial support. And that's where our battle will continue to ensure that all these children get the support. They're, they all come to kinship care the same. And they should all be treated the same at the end of the day. And uh, that's pretty much where we are at just now. Let's change that. Thank you, Anne, and um, I think you highlight some of the difficulties that kinship carers face across not just Scotland but the whole of the UK in setting out that whole issue, not just of where you came from over the last seven years at home in Scotland, but also in terms of the impact of universal credit and once defined, and we even have the, the initial rollout in Western Bartonshire, yeah, we do. and mm -hmm. nobody thinks it's going hunky-dory, but once you roll it out to every section of society, even in our own constituency, the problems are just going to mount and mount and mount. Uh, before I also introduce uh, Kim, can also welcome Patrick Grady, Member of Parliament for Glasgow North, and also Alison Thulis for Glasgow Central. Uh, Kim, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, we're, we're delighted to be here today, um, you know, campaign, working on this issue of valuing caring work with the Scottish Kinship Care Alliance and the Global Women's Strike is supporting today's you know, meeting. We've been working with Sadie and Anne in particular for you know, a, a while now. Um, I'm, I'm a single mum, but I've also been a kinship carer to um, one of my daughters. Um, her mum was unable to look after her because she wasn't supported as a single mum herself, as she should have been. And um, she 
you know, been with me. She's now 22 or 21, sorry. Um, <laughs> so fast. Um, I, I wanted to say that um, from the Global Women's Strike, we, the Single Mother's Self Defense is part of the Global Women's Strike, and we are demanding a living wage for mothers and other carers as the caring that work we do is the foundation of every society, most of it done by women, and it's completely devalued and underfunded. And we want all economic, social policies redirected towards caring. Um, we're also celebrating to, um, this year the 70th anniversary of family allowances, what we know as child benefit now. Um, and that was fought and won, a very hard struggle, um, by an independent feminist MP called Eleanor Rathbone. Um, and it was in recognition of the work mothers do and their right to be financially independent. Um, Mothers are primary carers everywhere in the world, and because our caring work is unvalued, undermined, under attack, and degraded, it sets the perspective on caring for the whole of the society, for the whole of our society. And all caring, all caring and those we care for are treated as dispensable and of no value. And that's how it is. If they don't treat us with any respect and value the caring work, that's how our loved ones are treated. Grandmothers, aunties, friends who are doing kinship care, as all the sisters here are, are undermined by all that. So then can they cut the hospitals, the care services, the children's centres, breastfeeding support, all of that can be cut because that's part of caring that they say in that they, is not to be valued. And they don't care if we live or die. And we found that with plenty of the benefit cuts and the sanctions, that a lot of people are dying because of those. Um, but we as carers are saving the government billions of pounds every year. In the UK, unpaid childcare is, is valued at £343 billion. Pounds. And unpaid care work, which is done by 6.8 million carers, saves the state £132 billion a year. So there is, that's, that's what we're saving. But we, we don't want them to save that money. We don't want it to be saved so that they can bail out the banks and they can give tax breaks to the rich and they can pay for war and trident and other weapons. We want it to come to care. That's what... years have all been about forcing mothers out to work and away, getting away from being able to do the care work of looking after our children. And if we're not full time out to work, then, then we are ignored. But mothers are exhausted and frantic. I mean, so, you know, and grandmothers, of course, who are here today, are frantic with the long hours, the low pay, no money to look, you know, no time or money to look after our children and our loved ones, and no time for our children to see us, their carers, their mums and their grandmas. And being overworked like this and undervalued is not liberation. Today is the 8th of March, which is International Women's Day, I should have said at the beginning. And this is not about liberation, you know, and we want a, a, a very different, you know, we want our work valued. Even women MPs, who were instrumental in cutting welfare to mothers, have had to just now admit how much mums hold families and communities together and even hold the whole of the economy together as well. Um, and we're, we're not against mothers going out to work, but we are against being forced out to work by politicians saying it's the only important work is to go out to work and our work is low-waged, very hard work, childcare is very expensive, and, no, and we have very long hours, and they have to pay attention to what mothers want. Just a quick statistic, that 88% of mothers with young children in full-time jobs would rather work part-time um, and or be full-time carers than have to be forced out to low-wage work like that. And no one in the government is asking why. Why mothers and kinship carers are getting nothing? Why grandmothers and carers are getting nothing? The Global Women's Strike has been working on getting this work you know, valued uh, uh, for quite a while, and we've been working particularly with Labour MPs in Westminster, especially John McDonnell, and we have a contribution to make to Jeremy Corbyn's new politics that we want that a women's perspective is to be seen as a serious 
perspective for everyone, our perspective on caring and getting caring valued. So we're demanding, as I said at the start, a living wage for mothers and other carers, and we feel that that would prioritise all caring relationships, which, as I said, are the foundation of all of the society, and we will win, you know, that way is a way to win what we're all, you know, deserving and all valued, you know, should be getting. Clear to the Member of Parliament for Angus. Uh, Mike, you're more than welcome. Uh, we'll move on quickly because I'm very conscious of time as well and I want as much time for questions. And if uh, we're going to go now for Sadie. Hi, yeah. folks. Uh, I've been a kinship carer for 11 years now. My main concern is education for our kids. When our kids get into school, age five, They're not recognised as kinship kids. Majority, I'd say 98% of kids have got problems all through addiction in their lives. Our babies are born addicted. They're withdrawn. It's been proven it affects the brain when these kids get into school, they're so hyper. Uh, they can't sit down, ADHD, autism, and they tell, kid, they tell grandparents it can't be checked out until these kids are at a certain age. But what happens, a kid gets put outside the classroom, it's a bad kid. We would like the government to stand by and say to education, these kids aren't bad. These kids need psychological help, educated, homework classes, mentoring. I've got a grandmother here they know. Our grandson turned 14, looked at a notice board in school, says, I would love to do that, become a dentist. This is the boys last year, all A's, because they get mentored. And that boy came from drug parents. <coughs> it can be done, but nobody is recognising kinship care kids. That's what I'm here for, to say, come on, these veins are Scotland's future. Help us. Sadie raises some very serious issues and they need to be tackled not just in Scotland but if you're from the rest of the UK or anywhere else in the world. Uh, we have major changes to the education system in Scotland which I support and I hopefully the government will take cognizance of what Sadie you're saying and what will be reported back from this meeting. And I can only ask you if you're from England, Wales or Northern Ireland, challenge your education authorities. Look north to different experiences and look beyond into the international sphere as well as to how we can promote this cause. So we'll go on now to Lee. Can you go, sir? Hello, from the south. Um, I'm speaking uh, today because uh, I was asked to contribute. Um, I was asked, well, I was actually informed about uh, this test case against the government through Carers UK, who told me about. Uh, this case, and if I would be interested in, in in getting involved, so I said, "Well, yes, because I'm in such dire straits, and this is affecting me." And they're talking specifically about benefit caps that uh, carers, adult carers, have to uh, to suffer because they're not living at home, caring for uh, a partner or someone that's caring for my grandmother in this case. Um, this uh, this uh, benefit cap affected about 1,400 people, so it's not a lot, but it is, you know, everyone should not fall under a certain glass floor. You know, this is what the welfare system was designed to do, to make sure everyone had a particular standard of life, which I wasn't having. In this paragraph here, I don't know if anyone's read this, it says the government that argued that unpaid carers should be treated in the same way as anyone else who is out of work and receiving benefits, so I was not. I was receiving less than someone in JSA, 
and doing a lot of work to try and keep my grandmother at a standard of life that she's unfortunately not really accustomed to. She's a hoarder. We've had very little to no help. We've had uh, councils trying to come in. Uh, we had house clearance. Um, the place is still in the mess. Um, I'm a single person on my own doing this by myself uh, for the last few years. I don't even know how long. This is ongoing and never seems to end. Um, I do it out of love for my grandmother. I do it because she does not want strangers coming into her house. One time that someone did was when she came out of hospital, that carer, that paid carer, had half an hour from door to door to get her dressed and downstairs. She wasn't allowed to walk in front of her to walk down the stairs because it was a health and safety issue. My grandmother went first, she slipped on the top step, and was back in hospital the next day with three fractures. This is the level of care that uh, the elderly in this country are in receipt of. It's substandard. If you look at Western Europe, the way that they treat their elderly over there is with utter respect. And there is no respect in this country for the elderly. They're shoved into homes. If they've got property, they're expected to sell that property to pay for their uh, home, to be housed. And that money goes like that. Unfortunately, my grandmother does own her own house, which was bought for by her parents for £100 in the 1930s. It was bought between my grandmother, uh, my great-grandfather great and his family. <coughs> my grandmother's born in that house. She doesn't want to let it go. Now we're facing a situation where I am struggling so hard to be able to afford to continue to look after her, to travel to her, to see her, and maintain my own independent life. Gave up work to be a carer for her. You know, I'm 40 now. I'm 41 this year. You know, that's my peak life, gone, when I could be doing something with my life, and I can't do it. And I feel that this government has not only brought in this outrageous benefit cap, which we defeated, thanks to Justice uh, Collins and his wonderful, uh, his wonderful way in which he, he, he uh, went through this case with us. He was clearly on side, man of integrity, I'd like to thank him officially really, I mean, uh, uh, just been so uh, overwhelmed, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, just to, so you know, the, uh, the savings that the NHS makes, 132 billion, that was from um, last year. The year before that was 119 billion saved. So you see it's not static, this is something that goes up and up and up. So I spoke to my solicitor after we've been through this. Basically what the government has done ha uh, by not, um, by not uh, trying to come back with a, you know, uh, an appeal is that they're admitting culpability here as far as I see it. They have accepted that they are wrong. The fact that this even went to court is outrageous. And why is it that we have to spend public money to go to court to defend our rights when we are in the right? We've yes. always been in the right. Yes. And the fact that no one speaks up and no one joins together, that has to change. And this is, this is the start of that change. Now, I do believe that we do work. We work bloody hard and get no recognition, no support, other than when a council wants to step in and get equity release on your grandmother's property so they can flog it. That's what it's about. Shove them in a home, we get the property, we can sell it on. I've seen it over the road. There was a man, Jim, who lived in his house for as long as I can remember. He had a, an autistic child who was taken into care when he was 50, that child. And he looked after him all those years. Then he ended up going to hospital and in a home. That house, the house was sold like that, I saw his uh, dead wife's fur coats from the 1950s being taken out and put into a bag of a van. That's how the elderly are treated in this country. That's how carers are treated in this country. And that's an unfortunate thing because it's also the person who is being cared for that suffers ultimately. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
just before I go, Lee, I know that Carol was just heading out. Was, uh, Carol Moran from Glasgow North, who probably has to go to another well, meeting. Apologies, I'm just kidding. Yeah. As we speak, and the, so. the, the, I think given the fact that Carol's about to go into committee shows the commitment of some of the members uh, to yeah. the cause and, and an understanding of it. Carol, thank you very much. Thanks thank very you. much, Martin. Thanks to those who are speaking and brave enough to tell their stories. It's really important. Yeah. Lee, can I just say that uh, you certainly set challenges, and I know that nothing's perfect in Scotland, it certainly isn't, but can I say to those who are going through everything that you are in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, shocking. Yeah. It is shocking. It's shocking. Yeah. It's not and shocking. I, 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 I certainly don't want to be overly political. Mm. Well, but, it, it, uh, what, what I would say is this, that you know, there are some members, I'm sorry, another member of Parliament just came in as well. Sorry, I can't remember your name. Oh, um, Sharon Hodgson, I'm Shadow of Children's Minister. So Char Sharon's here from the Labour Party. Delighted to see you, Sharon. Thank you for coming. Um, you will get support across the opposition. I'm sorry that the former other member who's uh, Mark Spencer's left is actually from the Conservative Party. So it might have slightly been a wee bit more problematic being on your own for that one. But I think you can, across the board in the opposition at least, and there are members in the governing party who will support you, but they find it very difficult for the government to listen. But we have seen some movement in some of the issues. But you raise, you raise an issue which about the diversity of caring relationships, yeah. whether it's for a child, whether it's for a vulnerable person, or for an adult. And not or, necessarily a relative or a relative. Or living relative yes, or a spouse. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that complexity, I think members of parliament across the UK, whether it's here in Westminster, in Holyrood, in Cardiff or in Belfast, need to give that its full recognition. But we'll plenty of time for questions, that's why I want to move on to Crystal. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, um, Crystal. Thank you. And thank you also to the Kinship Carers you know, for inviting me to speak and for inviting us here today. Because we face the same struggle north and south of the border and across the globe. Women and girls are doing a vast amount of kinship caring work, it's invisible. As Kim said, it's unrecognized, but without this caring survival work, millions would die. Yeah, that's right. I've been a carer since I was about eight. I had to think about that the other night. Um, I'm taking my brother to school and bringing him back and making food for us both if mum was still out of work. And then as a co-mother, I helped my partner raise her three daughters. Um, we now have three gorgeous grandchildren and one more on the way, which I was I got permission to tell you all today. <laughs> um, more recently, I looked after my mother when she had a serious stroke, and I did what my mum had done for her mum, which was nurse her until she died. That was stressful and painful to see a loved one who was once fit and so full of life having to adjust when not able to do basic things for herself. I fought to get her proper care in hospital, including cooking and taking nutritious food in to speed her recovery. I stopped her being given drugs and treatment that she didn't want. I pressed for resources. It took us six months to get a wheelchair for her. Yeah. And the cuts meant that the council wouldn't pay for any home adaptations. I couldn't get carer's allowance because I had a wage, a wage job. And we struggled to cope. And after a year, I had to. I had to put her into a care home. But she, just as Leah was saying, she was forced to sell her home, a bungalow that she built herself with her husband to pay and cover the costs. My mum was an immigrant from Germany after World War II, and like thousands of other immigrants, she helped to rebuild Britain and the welfare state. She was entitled to free care at the end of her life, like all of us are entitled. I work with the All African Women's Group, which is a group of women seeking asylum from uh, many of whom have been uh, many of whom are rape survivors. And for years now, people have been made destitute when their asylum cases are closed, often very unjustly. And many do form informal care work to just keep a roof over their head, <coughs> to ensure their children are fed. And there are thousands of immigrant mothers in the UK on low wage money sending money back to other kinship carers, often grannies in other countries who are looking after the children who have been separated from their mums. Here in Britain, 2.7% of black children are being raised in kinship care, and that is twice the number, in fact, over twice the number of white children. 
we've helped several women of colour who are fighting against social services, taking their children into care on the grounds that they are neglecting the children. It's not neglect, it's poverty. When you're living on £36 a week, and sometimes not even the money, just the voucher, we know that it's poverty. There are hundreds of thousands of children in, uh, doing care work for their siblings and looking after parents. The ONS estimated back in 2013 that 244,000 under 19s are carers, and about 23,000 under 9 are taking care of people. The Children's Society says this is the tip of an iceberg, so there is much, much hidden. Six million people, that is one in ten, care for a sick, disabled or older person. That's an immense amount of unpaid work, as everybody has said. We deserve a real living wage, and they can start by giving that to us. Yes. Thank you very much. And I, I think when you consider the, the impact on young black minority ethnic <coughs> children, and also those who might also be in a caring relationship that's quite extraordinary given the size of the population. Yeah. You also mentioned issues around rape as well uh, and, I'm, and I want to mention my friend and colleague Alison Phillips who is leading in, in terms of many of the parliamentarians who are backing her in terms of scrap the clause in terms of women having to identify the fact that they've been raped to a, a doctor in terms of benefit. It's an absolute mm -hmm. outrage and an absolute scandal. And the fact that we're at this in the 21st century, uh, has, I just couldn't, I, I, I find it implausible, implausible that we're in this situation. But you mentioned one word that many people in Parliament don't talk about when it comes to kinship care, and you talked about poverty mm -hmm. and the impact right. of poverty mm -hmm. and how being a kinship carer is impoverishing while at the same time it saves the state billions of pounds every year. So I'm going to go on and finally ask uh, Micheline to come in. And I, I'm honoured that it begins with Western Bartonshire and it ends with Western Bartonshire. So... I'm Micheline. I'm Micheline. I'm Micheline. I'm Micheline. I'm Micheline. Um, I'm a granny, a kinship carer. I'm also a carer to my mother, who unfortunately we've had to put in a home. And I quite wholeheartedly see where these come and fit. It's one of the worst things you can do. And when you're in a caring, Britain's meant to care. People call this the nanny state. Well, I don't know where they get the nanny state for, but it definitely is for this country. Um, we are left, kinship carers going to food banks, ridiculous. Our elderly who fought wars, did everything, they've got to sell the things for underneath their feet to get a hearing in this country. Absolutely ridiculous. We're children, they have children, we get them. If we're lucky, if we're not so lucky, and they're babies, they get taken away. They get fostered, and then if they're babies enough, and they think, well, Granny's got one, we'll just take the other one somewhere else, we'll get that out of our system. They take the other ones away. My wee granddaughter, which I know what he's in here, no. We had to fight a hard, hard battle to get that in here. And I would say it was probably the worst 14 months in my entire life. That's our family tree. That's my family tree. That's my kids' family. That's my brother's, my wee grandson's sister. The only sister he'll ever have. My daughter, when she had my granddaughter, was fighting for her life. And two social workers walked in and tried to take the baby from the hospital when my daughter hadn't even opened her eyes. This is me caring. This is barbaric. This is things that they in places you've never can heard of. But where do two people get the right to come in and take a tiny baby away from its mother when the mother hasn't even woken up for a life support machine? What kind of country is it we live in now? We have to stop this. This has to stop. There has to be a time where we say, and we all raise our voice and say, no, 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 no more. Give us what we're entitled to. Yeah. Look after us. Let us look after these children, because nobody else is going to look after them. They're not going to come in and look after them. We do it, we do it day in, we do it day out. 
We did for no money. Or else I've got a grandson who I've cared for eight years. He's disabled. I've never had one pence. My mum, who is now in care herself, if it wasn't for her, he was going to care. Because I couldn't have done it. I was never a single mother when I was married. I found myself a single mother with two grandchildren on my own. And I didn't even bring up my own three on my own. This country is going to the wall. The health system, knackered, everything. We've got to pay for everything, and if you can't pay for it, you don't get it. You don't get nothing. And in this country, you get nothing for nothing. I don't know where they get it for that we're all living this great high life, because nobody in this country is leading a high life, certainly no kinship carers or carers. I was carer to my disabled daughter, who is the mother of my two grandchildren. No, she, she was born with a chromosome disorder. She didn't inflict that on herself. That was, that was health. But she's had to fight, I've had to fight. And when do you say, I've <coughs> had enough of fighting now? Why is somebody not fighting for me, for my children? Because see these children? They're the next children coming. We've already got a lost generation. We've got a lost generation. We've lost them. Thatcher's government lost them. We've lost that. We're bringing up the knock-on effect of that generation. So why is people not trying to stop this knock-on effect now and saying, look after these children. Let the mothers look after their yes. children. Yes. Not the grandmothers, not the carers, not the nannies. The mothers, if they want to stay home, and look after their children. And if they can't stay home, and there's reasons they can't look after their children, help them. And only then take them away. When you know you can't do any more for these children, we'll fight and we will keep on fighting until we get what we want. But this country needs to stand up and listen, we ain't going away. We're not a bunch of stupid old wee grannies that are going to sit <laughs> and knit wee hats for the rest of your days and bring up children. Oh, We're going to stand up. <laughs> We're going to stand up and we are yeah. going to fight. And if more people did it, the less they would get away with in this country. It's time to stand up, be counted, and say enough is enough. Care for the carers. Yeah. If you could you edit that better? <laughs> uh, and I think you set a range of challenges to politicians. Um, yeah. Oh, we've got a vote. Sorry, the members might need to. We're okay. We're sorry. Uh, the SNP, thankfully, is, you know, we don't need to vote on this one. That's a cracker. Uh, so glad. <laughs> Easy escape. Somebody tell me about that. Never looked at my email before I came up. Um, but Micheline, you go to the, the heart of the subject matter and it is political choice about members of the House of Commons, critically around issues of benefit, and also about the choices that they make, whether it's benefit or other policies. Now, it will be slightly political because the only members of Parliament here are against, for instance, the renewal of Trident. I'm not assuming that everybody in the room is either anti or pro-Trident, but I would rather, being a member of Parliament, suppose. Yeah, I would rather that that were spent on the NHS. Yeah. 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 I would rather that for our brothers and sisters in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, that the bedroom tax would be mitigated by the British government. Yeah. Yeah. I would hope that that money in Scotland, while we're mitigating it with a reduced budget, would allow us to invest further. But um. I wanted to finish up person on a personal part. I'm deeply honoured and proud that you are leading this as your member of parliament and also from a personal experience. My mother uh, died very young. She brought up children, one who was profoundly mentally and physically handicapped. And I will go to my grave saying that that brought the early death of my mother as a carer. That then had the impact on my father, who had to go to work in the shipyards and the clades and the kind of stuff that we need to work 14 hours a day, and the burden that it placed on my sister, and the burden it placed on my aunts. And on International Women's Day, and I, I'm also keen aware that we, uh, in terms of uh, being a man, but I just want to think it's critically important that the impact of women 
in kinship caring yes. and in caring mm -hmm. is central and critical and that you are the heart of the type of society that we want to create and we need to fight for and that's the one in which the NHS and the welfare state was founded and I am delighted that I believe in a political process that puts that at the heart of it. In Scotland you have a chance in, the next ele in our election in May to hold us to account and whilst nothing is perfect we need to continue those challenges. But to those of you in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, you have to agitate, you need to be political, and you need to be involved in the wider community to make sure that they recognise what you're doing and how you are saving their society from the worst impact of what not funding kinship care is all about. Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, one of the bonniest parts of Scotland, can I say. Uh, it's absolutely stunning, but I think, Margaret, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, thank you. I just want three minutes of your time, if you don't mind, Lucy. As I say, my name's Margaret, I'm from Dumfries and Galloway, and I've been a kinship carer for 12 years. For five of those years, uh, I brought up three grandchildren without any financial, in fact, without any help at all from my local authority. I would like to bring to your attention about Kinship carers in Jim Fries and Galloway, they've got, we've got a lot of concerns up our way in this bonny borders regarding the new kinship care allowance. A recent development whereby 16 year olds are now having their allowance stopped. Why stopped, you may ask? And that's because residence orders stop when a child turns 16. Yet, if that same child was in foster care, they would continue to receive payment. What I'm asking is this parity with foster carers. I would say it isn't, so no it isn't. This is not what the Scottish Government expected to take place in my eyes. Kinship allowances to make the lives of kinship children better, not to drive them into poverty. The Scottish Government also expect that in line with the parity agreement, children would now receive payment for holidays and birthdays. In the Priest and Galloway, they're clearly saying that they'll not be paying those extra weeks because the Scottish Government themselves, they didn't state clearly that parity with foster carers included all as aspects of the foster care system or scheme. <coughs> there is a lot of policies and legislation, a lot of focus has gone in to the children in the early years. When it comes to 16 and 18 year olds, they are the forgotten children. And Dumfries and Galloway have proved that with a change in policy. What Dumfries and Galloway must not forget is that these kinship children are part of Scotland's future. So it's vital that we protect their future. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, and like other speakers, I think you set the challenge for people who are setting policy. And I would say that whilst we have the Scottish Government elections in this May, we also have local government elections in 2017. And I would say to everybody across Scotland, make sure that you hold local authorities to account. It's very important. And I know, I know that Anne does especially. <laughs> and the challenges for and Michelina as well for Western Barbershire. But let's open the floor. Um, if the Member of Parliament and also I'd like to see uh, Neil Gray to be able to join us as well. Airtrain Shops for right. Neil. Got that right, so glad. I was getting so wrong. So, uh, Neil, thank you very much for joining us. And the questions we can answer, I think it's just Scottish MPs here. So, much of what happens in Scotland is devolved. So, that's done by our members of our Parliament in Holyrood. But if you're from the rest of the UK and we can at least express an opinion, ask about experience. Um, let's go for it and see where we go, okay? And we've got till three o'clock. So, can I show sure, hands up for anyone who's got a question? And if you could just say your name and also where you're from, okay? Uh, my name is Sam Weinstein. I'm from England, but I have a statement from a woman in Ireland okay. um, who is a carer, Maggie Ronane. Um, I'm really delighted to hear about your event today. So, so needed and so on time. I have cared for my mother Mary for many years. She is now 84 years old and has dementia. She has always wanted to stay in her own home. 
I have a wage job and live over 100 miles away, so it's been a continual battle with the state health service to get her the care she needs when I'm not there. Even though she couldn't cook her own food or do shopping and often neglected to eat proper food, the health service didn't want to pay for the extra hours of home help needed. I had to put it in writing that she was at risk from falling and malnutrition and pressured them repeatedly by phone and in person before they gave in. I worry constantly about what will happen to my mother when I'm not around. In January, I had to stop the police and medical professionals from drugging her and taking her to hospital when what she actually needed was increased care in her own home. The care work I do is only a fraction of what's needed to care for my mother around the clock. I have only managed because of the low wage care work of other women, <coughs> assistants in nursing homes and home helps. Women who go beyond the hours they are paid to be my eyes and ears on the ground. Austerity has made this work so much harder. Their wages and hours have been slashed and they face impossible workloads like trying to get people up and washed and dressed in 15 minutes or less. Yeah. They're fighting for better wages and against the curbs, the, the cuts in their hours. A lot of carers also do a double day as we also have to do wage work to make ends meet. Because caring work takes up so much of your time, you're either on part-time at your wage job or you struggle on a full-time and are labeled as underperforming. You lose wages, promotions, and pensions. Carers, overwhelmingly women, face a lot of discrimination in the wage workplace. Supported by the Global Women's Strike and Payday, I'm involved in a campaign at my wage workplace, the National University of Ireland, Galway, against discrimination and for pay equity. It's very obvious that some of the worst problems are experienced by mothers and other carers. You can't be available to the employer 24-7. Well, we don't want to be available. So we are determined to make clear that valuing the unwaged caring work that keeps the world going is central to pay equity for all of us, women and men, who are for caring, not killing. I'm just going to see maybe if Kim... Well, maybe, I mean, the, there's different people speaking. I know there's also some people, there's kinship carers from Wales who okay. make a statement today as well. Is there someone, is somebody who got from Wales, what type of statement? I've got there are other carers yeah. here. Yeah, just, on, I mean, just before you do, but in terms of Ireland is another, it's a sovereign state, and I think what it does <laughs> highlight the fact that this is a complex international situation, yes. Yes. but it critically impacts women the most. And it yeah. is about impoverishment, mm -hmm. poverty, and this place and other parliaments, even in the Dial Erin, doesn't like the word poverty. Yeah. It's real, and that personal lived experience should be taken by them to their local member of the, the Dial Erin, and I would advise you to tell them to do so, and along with their colleagues in Ireland to continue to do so. Uh, sorry, sorry, you're in the, just there if you want to say it. Tell me where you're from, who you are, and where you're from. Sure, my name is Michael Kalmanowitz. I'm actually from Paley Men's Network, which works with the Global Women's Strike. And we help produce this kinship care fact sheet for today. I did want to... Thanks for it's going to be given out as well. Okay. I just wanted... To, uh, people have been expressing how scandalous the situation is for kinship care. I just wanted to pick out one scandalous statistic that children in care, not kinship care, about 0.5 of the, the population of children in the UK. Yet, when they are adults, they are 27% of the prison population. It shows the absolute shortcomings of the care system, and it, should, it does assume the complete neglect of kinship care and of mothers in not providing the support that's needed for them. I used to be a, a worker in a children's home and also a social worker, and it was just impossible to get the money for mothers, for nurseries, for uh, rehousing, for money for holidays, for carpets, for food. Just not available. But just let me tell you, even when it was available, so many social workers didn't care to go for the money for the mothers to look after their kids. It was a bit outrageous. <laughs> Uh, this is um, a, a letter from Paul and Sue Brothers from, from Pembrokeshire in Wales. Being kinship carers isn't always easy. Some local authorities, social services are better than others at providing support. 
So like the getting discretionary housing payments to cover the rent shortfall in bedroom tax cases, getting help to look after family members is a postcode lottery. Like so many other kinship carers around the UK, Sue and I have had to fight every step and in every way to get help from our local authority here in Pembrokeshire to look after Warren, our grandson. All we want to do is give him the best life as we possibly can and really, we wonder why we have to fight so hard. We have a great social worker, but he can't give us any financial help. They are trying to cut our care at the moment, despite knowing it would cost a quarter of a million quid plus a year to look after Warren in our home. If Sue and I were foster carers, we would be getting a thousand quid plus to look after Warren, plus payments to help with extra carers. We would be getting money for all sorts of extras, in inverted commas, like birthdays, holidays, and Christmas too. When Warren was first brought to Sue from England, she had no idea about benefits or formal informal care arrangements. And of course, nobody told her when they realized she didn't know. But we are forced, like so many kinship carers we've spoken to, to live on benefits, to beg for every bit of help we need to look after Warren. We think that's wrong. Kinship carers are helping to save money, so much money for the government, who rely on the fact that we love our families. Sue and I would be here today if we lived closer to London. We wish we could be here anyway, but Pembrokeshire is a long way to come, and I'm still recovering from the trip. But we support the Scottish kinship carers here today and hope that everyone starts to realise what kinship carers are and what they are worth. back to them, the, our thanks for them participating by letter and again the live testimony is very important yeah. they should also be forcibly forced, uh, sharing that with the members of the Legislative Assembly, the MLAs for the Welsh Assembly and also <coughs> Welsh constituency MPs and they should be vocal in holding them to account. Let's go to the floor and see if we have any questions. Got them well I don't have a question but I've had a statement here from Mothers at Home Matter before we can I just, just I'll let you in, but I know there's a, there is a question, so I'm just conscious of time if there's any questions before any further statements. Is there anybody get any questions? Just say your name and where you're from. My name's Nikki, I'm from the Women's Centre, and um, I wondered from the Scottish Kingship Carers, you said that um, people should really raise their voices in Parliament, which I agree with, and I feel like people do, have been working very hard to do that. But some of the opposition that we have faced has been from feminist politicians who say this is not a key women's issue, that they've reduced women's issues to things like abortion and sometimes pay equity, but sometimes not even pay equity. And I wondered whether the Scottish kinship carers have, you know, who is kind of on your side and who has been uh, your main obstacles, really, to kind of getting your voices heard in Parliament and in public? We've done what I've done then. Everybody's going to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we went, to, we went to Scottish Parliament on the side and we were not going away. We shut the windows on, we just didn't even put a few. But um, we went and these ladies went very hard out in the hail, rain, sleet, snow, and there's no Scotland doesn't need that in a warm country. <laughs> So we got out with the megaphones and we shouted and we shouted and we went back and we shouted some more because the only way to get it done in this country is to shout. If you're going to sit back and take it, they're going to shout. So I'd say to everybody, everybody, get up and stand up. As Bob Marley would say, for your rights. So why spend all this money on wars? There's children in this country starving. There's children in this country in poverty. There's carers caring in a caring society supposed to be who are having to sell everything they've got to maintain some sort of living standard. But there is no living standard. When you can pass a kinship carer and they're dying, they want to die because they come out a food bank. You're looking after somebody else's child, you put your life up. What, what cost does your life cost? That's our life. We give up our life to look after our loved ones, sit with our mums, our dads, our children, whatever. Doesn't matter who we give it up for. We give up our lives. So is there a cost on that? Is there a cost, uh, a minimum wage cost of giving up your life? They can't put money on that. And another thing they can't put money on is people's health and their well-being. 
and that is something they've delivered to a cost on. And it's time this country stopped putting it to war and giving it to who needs it, and that's the children, the mothers, the carers, in this, in this country, in this country, where we live. And you all need to get up in England, in Wales, in Ireland, and say, no, no, we're going to stand outside your buildings, we're going to stand in the street, we're going to be holding my megaphone, <laughs> but we're not going to be quiet and we're not going to go away, because there's, we've, not got, we've got parity. But we've not got quality. We've got a long, long road still yeah. to go. Everybody's saying, oh, he's made legislation, he's got this. What did we get? Mm -hmm. Another big headache for Dumfries and Galloway. Mm -hmm. Children still going to be worse off than they were before. Mm -hmm. They take it back, they give it, and then they take it back again. Mm -hmm. They will find a way to get that back. Can I just say, I, can I, just say I, I think you're saying under sales, what you do, and it's not just about the megaphone activity, it's the fact that I, mean, let's, I think we need, not, not everything's perfect in Scotland, oh, no. but we live, we live in a country of five million people, which you usually live cheap to jail, because we're usually on the central belt, and there is no escape as a politician on the front line at home, and that's the way it should be. And if there's anything I could add to what Micheline says, is that their example is about making sure that kinship care as an issue is not just about you as an individual but it's about the wider impact on your community yeah. and the services that it seeks to support. Yeah, but I'd just say this in a slightly political term. I represent a constituency which has the majority of the workforce of a nuclear submarine base. And they returned a member of parliament who fundamentally rejects the replacement of Trident. Yeah. Fundamentally. Yeah. <laughs> rather that money were spent not just on kinship care issues, no. not just on health, but on education, yes, even on international development, but not on weapons of mass destruction, because that cares for nobody, and that's the reality. But they undersell themselves. They're at everything. They engage, they participate in both. And in Scotland, it's quite, and I don't take up everybody's time, but community health and care partnership structures are critical in terms of kinship care. And both Anne and Micheline have been very proactive in my constituency for a number of years. And I have known about them for a number of years. A long time before I lost my hair. But anyway, <laughs> that was all right. <laughs> but joking aside, be involved in your structures. Don't be caught up in your own structure. Get involved in the structures that they create. Yeah. Because that's when you really start to annoy them. Okay. Lee, you had a question. Yeah, I was just going to answer the question. The simple answer is we have a malicious government who just doesn't care. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Just, just, just question like, uh, have you come up against uh, people who are trying to prevent progress? Well, yeah. We, we, some of us, not in this room, I dare say, voted them in. Um, Yes, there is, there is the, the, you know, the, the rallies of vigils and, and, and lobbying and, and going to surgeries and all the rest of it. With me, I, I had no other recourse but to go through the courts. And we must always remember the courts are there. Unfortunately, legal aid isn't there. Um, thankfully, in my case, I was eligible. God knows how, but thank you. Thank God for Rebecca uh, Carey, who, who was remarkable in putting this case together. Um, so there is always a remit, but I guess if there's enough people together, and enough people who know people who know people, there are ways to take these issues to court. And it's sad. It's sad that we have to take a government to court to task on numerous occasions over the last few years. And it's ongoing. And you know what? We're winning. Mm -hmm. Do you hear about it in the press? No, not really. It gets buried in the pages. You know, they announce all these big legislation, <coughs> you know, these cuts in welfare and all the rest of it. And it's still just taking bite now. But it really does. I mean, okay, you know, here we've got links to the Mirror and the Guardian. Even the Daily Mail were. Uh, surprisingly uh, sympathetic, even though they did drag out my mental health issues and, and things within their uh, report and dug into my uh, 
into my life, which I felt was more of a sort of, oh, look, he's still a benefit cheat kind of angle. You know, that, that's the kind of thing. It, don't be discouraged. Um, it can be done. Where we go from here, that's another issue, because that win in the, uh, in the High Court is now open to what happens now. And we need to decide what happens now. And I'm with, I think, the majority of the people here, a living wage, because it is work. And when the, uh, when the, uh, the government's uh, barristers were arguing that it was, uh, it was not work, Justice Collins said yeah. he found that that was uh, offensive, somewhat offensive to me. So, you know, we do have, we do have a judiciary, we do have a, a, a legal system that can be there for you. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a roll of the dice who you get. Luckily for me, I had Justice Collins. Thank you. Yeah, you just say who you are and where you're from, and I've got a roll of questions, and I'm just conscious. Okay. You can make it a brevity, yeah. but um, sure. concise. Yeah, I'm Jacqueline Smell, I'm a parent carer. I live in London. I have a 23-year-old autistic son. Uh, what I want to know is, in what I've uh, encountered along the way, as I went from a single parent uh, carer to care of an adult, I... Um, the care <clears throat> component that I was given got diminished as my son got older, which was the other way around, I think. And I, I also noticed that there is no uh, legislative sort of... Uh, there's nothing for um, people with disability who are mentally a child, but they're physically, they become an adult. Mm -hmm. They're considered an adult <coughs> as soon as they turn 18, and my son has got a mental age of eight, and he probably will have it for the rest of his life. Um, and um, I don't know, his care, it, it gets more difficult, but what I get uh, in a week is less than my respite care gets in a day. Um, and I'm a full-time care 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Um, I've, I've been a postgraduate degree, um, and I'm a carer. Uh, and I'm on a hundred pounds a week. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to put him in a home. Yeah. He gets dropped up. Yeah. I don't want to be dropped up and just put away in a, in a room quietly. I take him to college. I, I enter him in uh, things to do, um, to have a, an active lifestyle. But like you said, I'm losing my, yeah. my prime years. Mm -hmm. And I've got a pension at the end of it. And then to be told by barristers that we're slackers and we're yeah. not you know, taking up part-time yeah. work. I was sitting outside the court crying when <laughs> yeah, I mean, the judge was, very uh, was talking about it because it was going to be me. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I think I, I just take some concerns you know, the fact that the Daily Mail were having it, well, you're, you're in good company. Because, you know, I think I know. you have to go at my fellow ma members of my group in Parliament all the time, and it's absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. but the fact that they're having a go at someone like yourself in, in terms of your own experience as well. There's no distinction for mental, uh, yeah. mental age. Yeah. Uh, they suddenly become an adult. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've got to admit, I'm not a, a, a specialist in mental health, but I know there is a distinct mental health act in Scotland and, and separate from the mental health uh, in England and Wales. And I, I don't know if there's a, a difference. You in terms try not of being depressed when yeah. you care. No, definitely. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, mean, I was, and I'll be I'll tell you about my own personal experience earlier. My youngest brother was profoundly physically and mentally disabled. Uh, died when he was 15, and my dad had to go to work. We were looked after, as I said, by aunts and my big sister. But my big sister and I, once I reached a certain age, who cared for him? You know what that meant? Getting up in the middle of the night. We means oh, I left school with absolutely nothing. You know, didn't go into higher education until further on. But I wouldn't be here today for the women in my life who struggled every day to make life bearable. Or women like you, and it's a well, scandal that you. Well, my son's a yeah. medical student at St George's, so there's well, one that's a, <laughs> ray of sunshine. That's possible know, because of someone like you. My life. I'm yeah. hoping that he's going to take care of his mum when yeah. he gets Congratulations. <laughs> Down at the bottom there. <coughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Did you just yeah. say who you are? Uh, as a statement, can you make it very brief? Yeah. Um, I'm from the Crossroads Women's Centre. Um, I've been asked to read this. Sorry, what's your name? Uh, Nicola. Nicola. Okay, this is from Mothers at Home Matter. On behalf of the wider membership and Mothers at Home Matter supporters, we're delighted you're having this event in Parliament today. And we're sorry that our mothers cannot be here, mainly due to their responsibilities of caring at home. 
This is an essential reminder of the vital importance of caregiving to the human condition, and having time to care is absolutely indispensable throughout the family cycle for people of all ages, and in spirit of intergenerational generational solidarity. I'm just going to skip a few bits. Yeah, good, that'd be good. Thank you. Um, mothers at home matter exist because most of us, especially women, will find ourselves caring for others at some point in our lives, especially when we care for children. We don't exist because we believe mothers are only important when at home caring for the family. Rather, it's so that all mothers, when at home, however long or short that period is, are properly and fairly treated during that important time. And I'll just end with, uh, few people would disagree that we are now desperately needing a more caring society and one where more people are able to prosper, feeling hopeful about the future and more secure. And this means a country where we can rely on each other. We hope that the event here in the House of Commons today on International Women's Day will lead to a more honest debate and full consultation of the care challenges faced by young and old. Thank you. Um, I will come back to you, don't worry if we get time, but I'm just working my way around the room and also thankful to Peter Grant, Member of Parliament for Ben Rothis for joining as well. Bad nice work. Coming in as well at the end there, Claire, do you had a question. Yeah. Well, it was just it was just a comment about the discussion on um, people with learning disabilities and independent living. That um, you know, families are having to place <coughs> uh, place their loved ones in institutions like like Winterbourne View that was closed down, where uh, the local authority was paying the company three thousand pounds a week per resident you know, for them to be abused and for people to have uh, mouthwash poured in their eyes and stuff like that. And, um, you know, as disabled people, we want independent living. We want to be able to live in supported communities. And, um, you know, the government cuts to the council funding means that, you know, those facilities are not available um, in many places. And, you know, families are living hundreds of miles away from where their adult disabled um, children are living. And um, as, as disabled people, many of us, especially women, are not exempted from the caring responsibilities that all women have. Um, we're often the ones who have time during the day to go with elderly parents to hospital appointments and all that sort of thing. And we're also fighting for recognition that coping with disability is a workload which deserves recognition in its own right, as well as um, you know, those who um, care for us being recognised. And, you know, and we are fighting against the genocidal policies where you know, our, our benefit rights um, are, are being cut and equality is being seen as not not being entitled to anything, anything yeah. special, because yeah. we're all equal now, yeah. and you know we're fighting against that, and we're supporting Jill Thompson tomorrow outside the DWP, who is a, a campaigner against benefit sanctions to highlight what's happening not only to disabled claimants but also JSA claimants having our benefit rights taken. Well. Yeah, it's just uh, another piece of legislation that has just come in in Scotland recently is what they call the named persons. Now, they, you know, that's there for every child up to the age of 18. Now, we were given the care of these children. We were then guided towards what we call the residence order, which gives us the parental rights to these children. It's a shared parental rights that we have the overriding sort of power on that from the parents. We are now in a position as kinship carers. When our children reach 16, they're still going to have this name person. But our residence orders go, what? Who's, in, you know, who's, that, that child will live with us like any, I suppose, child of your own up to they're ready to leave home. Our caring responsibilities don't stop at 16. They carry on to these children. Are, they're not ours, but our responsibility does not end to these children at a specific age or a piece of paper. We're there for these children 24-7 for as long as they need us. 
a want us to be there in the room. And you see, and that's a very interesting point about the looked after child legislation. I think personally it's a very important piece of legislation, and yeah. it's, for me it's very welcome. But what I think we need to be very aware of, it does, it is, it, there is no requirement technically for either a parent, a carer or a child to take up the advice that the named person gives them. But I think you know, that point you raise about your role from 16 beyond I'm sure that my colleagues in the room from the party, the governing party of Scotland, will certainly be listening to what you're saying about that, because that looks like a gap. Yes, yeah. 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 I think what the aim of the alliance does is that mm. we look for the loopholes, yeah. we look for the gaps, yeah. and we then set out to plug those gaps. Yeah. You know, and like this market was saying, you know, there's a lot. Of Loopholes yeah. that the the Jason Gallagher finding. Mm -hmm. There's other local authorities as well across mm -hmm. Scotland who we're well, finding are do what they can to not support well, these see, children. There are there's, there's 32 local authorities, mm -hmm. and every one of them are going to find a loophole. Mm -hmm. No, just Margaret. Exactly. Every one of them are going to find yeah. a loophole. I, I know there's, there's another couple of questions. A lady at the back there, uh, had your hand up earlier behind you. Just, yes, yes. Can you just stand up, say who you are and where you're from? Okay, uh, my name's Carrie and I'm, oh, okay. uh, I'm a granny, a grandmother. Yay. I just want to say something about that because I'm not a, a kinship carer. I take all my hats off to you guys completely. But I was looking at um, some figures um, and I look after uh, one of my grandchildren once, once a week. Um, and I just looked into that and how many, there are 14 million grandparents in this country, 82% now are doing some kind of childcare for their grandchildren, which is extraordinary. It's really gone up uh, from 33% uh, in the last uh, century, I think it was, to 82%, which is very, very high. Um, and I reckon, I did some, made some calculations uh, based on how much I know, I, you know, my daughter goes out to work as a part-time teacher. So on the basis of, you know, how much, and she's really pushed out to work because she needs to. You know, she needs to go out to work because they don't have enough money. Um, but based on the fact that I save her over 40 weeks, you know, the amount I save her, um, and the amount, and then the number of carers that there are in this country, uh, we worked out that, that uh, all this invisible work that we're doing is the value of it, is, it must be around something like 34 and a half billion pounds. And that's only, um, I'm an average granny looking after a grandchild on doing like 12 hours a week. So <coughs> you guys who are doing 24 hours a day, you know, you just have to top that up. And it just strikes me that, as I think Nikki <coughs> mentioned, that the government is really relying, you know, they're pushing all these young women especially out to quite low wage jobs, very low wage jobs, you know, just because they have to survive, but they're absolutely relying on the fact that they can only do that because us grandmothers and some grandfathers, you know, are um, ready to do that childcare because we, you know, we love our grandkids, but you know, that's what they're relying on, absolutely relying on when they have this policy of pushing particularly um, young mothers out to work. Before, I'm to, this will be the final question, but just before we get our two members of Parliament come in, get Drew Henry's Inverness. He has the longest constituency name in the House of Commons. Inverness, Nairn, Bartnock and Strath Space. So Drew, thank you. Yeah. 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 Just remember your name again, sorry, in your constituency. Sarah Champion, Rotherham. I'm afraid I'm the big bad wolf because I'm coming to kick you out because I've got a child. Yes, we're just about to, right just give us a wee second and okay. we will be right out. Yeah, we were technically like booked in for half three, but we, will, we are just about to leave. So bear with me. Um, so one final question, and then we're going to round yeah. up very quickly. Um, I just I wanted to bring. So your name first again. I'm, I'm Sarah, and I'm from, a, I'm from a network of women of color, and I wanted to thank the um, you know the Scottish Kitchen Carers for calling this meeting. This is the perfect way that you know to get together on International Women's Day. I wanted to give two figures that the governments government spend a hundred billion annually subsidizing corporations, and in 2008. The British, British government gave 375 billion to the banks alone. 
So it went to the richest 5%. We've seen worse inequality in society, more poverty. Um, wages have gone down. Our living conditions have gone down. So I think the, the getting back the money, that's leaving out all the money they spend on war, which is, you know, billions and, and trident. So I think, I just want to say that I think the most important thing for me from this meeting is that we get together from our different corners. Because in Scotland you have a struggle. The brother spoke about defending, you know, his mom. Uh, people with disabilities, women with disabilities are fighting. I will need to ask the because there are other people waiting <coughs> to get into I just, wanted, I just wanted to finish by saying that people of color are fighting, are also kinship carers. And we can't forget there are people in other countries who are kinship carers with no money at all, no running water. Yeah. And we have to get together. That's the only yeah. way we'll win is if we all get together worldwide. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. We are now going to be picked out in a minute, though we're about to have three. But can I just congratulate you all and thank you all for coming, for travelling so many distances to be yeah. here in Parliament today, yeah. and to congratulate you for the work and thank you for all that you do in terms of kinship care and have a safe journey home. Yeah.